and good afternoon. Welcome to our virtual ECFR meeting room and our discussion on the Eastern Met. Uh, I am very happy to um, have all of you here on my screen, uh, of a, not in person, which uh, I regret very much. Um, but still, here you are, and I hope that we will uh, spend an hour and 15 minutes uh, together um, in uh, kind of an entertaining spirit. Um, with us uh, to discuss this topic uh, is uh, George Papandreou, who is now a member of Parliament, but the former Prime Minister um, of Greece. And we are super delighted to have you here, George, um, especially because you hosted Ibrahim uh, Kalim just last week. So um, it is for us very important to have a balanced approach uh, to this topic and to have um, also the Greek view. Um, so thank you very much for, for doing this. And with us um, are also Dorothy Schmidt, who is a senior research fellow at IFRI, and Asle Adin Tashbash, who is my colleague at ECFR, a senior policy fellow. And um, yeah, I couldn't think of a better panel to discuss this issue. Um, we will kick you off with some introductory remarks and then uh, give all of you the possibility to engage with the panel, to ask questions, to make comments. Um, and yeah, I hope um, that, um, that I see you when you raise your hand or you can also write in the chat that you want to have the floor. Um, but without further ado, I mean, the topic is, I think, well present and very, very clear to everybody. So we're talking about the Eastern Met and about strategies to de-escalate the situation, about Europe's role, about yeah, the Greek perception, the Turkish perception, and um, how to find a way out of this. Um, and George, the floor is yours. Please kick us off. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for this initiative. And uh, I think it's very important to have this discussion. And as the topic uh, focuses uh, not only on the Eastern Mediterranean Greek-Turkish relations, but also Europe's role, I'll start trying to describe Europe's role and how it import it's important as we're coming up to a, an EU summit in the next few days. Five points. First point is Europe needs to be more self-confident. It has untapped potential in dealing with issues, whether they're regional or global. I see that Europe has, has been a peace project. It's, um, it could become one of humanizing globalization. But let's take the example of the pandemic. I think for the first time, really Europe stepped up to deal with this. There are many aspects, of course, it hasn't dealt with, but still it has shown its capacity in contrast to the refugee crisis. And I would say in contrast even to the financial crisis where at least it was slow in dealing with this and let relegated most of the responsibility to member states. Second point. We are in an era now in foreign policy where there is narrow-minded transactional foreign policy. That phrase is not mine, that's Ban Ki-moon's phrase. And it's become dominant in the world, and luckily it even has been adopted by the current US administration, but of course many other countries too. It's not a new phenomenon. We in the Balkans have been a victim of this, global and regional powers in antagonistic proxy wars for you know, influence and power. And this situation now is what we see also in the Mediterranean, that's in the wider Middle East. So my second point, the European Union needs to stand at the opposite pole of this narrow-minded, egocentric, transactional foreign policy. Well, let me put it differently. Our national interests are better served and we're more effective when we cooperate and incorporate these national interests into common goals, policy, collective action, in the wider union. So whether they're Solana, Ashton, Mogherini, or Borrell, it's not only representing the union outside, but it's also working together to create uh, and incorporate national interests into an effective EU foreign policy. We did this effectively in 1999 to 2004, where Turkey was rewarded with candidacy, but there was also a clear roadmap for implementing EU principles within its country and its neighbors. I was in foreign minister and Actually, that began an era of flourishing new relations between Greece and Turkey, which we hadn't witnessed before. Very constructive, and I think we can learn much from that period. Third point, which brings me to the, what Europe is. Europe is a union of values. Uh, we're not just representing one or another country, but there are certain common values we must adhere to. 
And I think that's in the message to the region and to Turkey particularly. The common values is a way to contribute to our security, whether we're citizens, human rights, or whether it's the region in geopolitical terms. It needs to be the guiding light. Our neighborhood policy, which we actually developed in 2003 during the Greek presidency, needs to be enlightened with certain principles. For example, no use of violence and no threat of violence. This must be very clear and there should be no unilateral actions that are against any member or a third country or violation, for example, of sovereign rights. I think these are important principles. A fourth point is, which is also immediate relevance to our relation with Turkey is that disputes such as border disputes, continental shelf, maritime zones must be resolved through peaceful dialogue and in good faith. And if this dialogue does not resolve these issues, then we can use international arbitration, International Court of Hague, and so on. Uh, not imposing solutions by force through dialogue and possibly necessarily if dialogue doesn't work through the international law and, and courts. This, this simple principle was enshrined in the conclusions of the European Union in the Council of Helsinki in 1999. Uh, and these conclusions paved the way to give Turkey candidate status in the European Union, but it also opened up a new era of relations between Turkey and Greece and the two communities on Cyprus. Uh, that's when we started the so-called exploratory talks. We started them at that point. Uh, we developed bilateral relations with Turkey. Uh, we, 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 we signed more than, I think, 30 bilateral agreements when we hadn't signed similar agreements for 40 years. And we started cooperating in the region. Greece and Turkey were cooperating in the Balkans. Greece and Turkey were cooperating in the Middle East. I went with Ismail Cem to meet Ariel Sharon and Yasser Arafat together. That was showed the strength in this unity and the possibilities we can have if we cooperate. Final fifth point, the EU needs to develop a comprehensive regional strategy. There have been different attempts around the Mediterranean. We did so in the late 90s and early 2000 um, uh, for the Balkans. Uh, a roadmap, of course, was a roadmap for future membership. Of course, in the East Med, we're not talking about membership, but we can look at similar results, peaceful cooperation, regional cooperation, sustainable development, rule of law, human rights, and so on. We also need to see a bottom up. The best would be, of course, if we ourselves in the region could develop a vision of a more cooperative um, regional uh, construction. Sounds a little bit utopic uh, because of the many conflicts with Syria, whether it's Libya, whether it's Palestine, Israel, conflict and many others, of course, in the region. Yet, this should be the goal and this is where I think Europe should move. But the elephant in the room, of course, is our relationship between the EU and Turkey. I have always been a proponent of keeping the accession process going despite the problems. I know membership of Turkey in the European Union is not a popular issue in the European Union. Nevertheless, we should not abandon this. We should, it should be a tool for integrating Europe into a wider cooperation. And if necessary, let's think about an interim relationship a Helsinki too, if you like, where we can serve both the interests of the European Union and its members and Turkey, a win-win situation. I say this because I have been a champion of good relations with Turkey and uh, also Greek-Turkish relations and of course EU-Turkish relations. I was the one that, as prime minister that pushed the East Med cooperation on energy issues. I wanna make it clear, however, it was never my intent and it is not the intent of, the, of Greece to marginalize Turkey in this process. Turkey needs to be part of this. However, their recent rhetoric has been extreme. Uh, I've never seen it before. Uh, and it, is, it has been threatening, it has been threatening with violence. And I think we've seen a militarization of Turkish foreign policy. And it's not just Greece or Cyprus. They have difficult relations with Israel, with Egypt, with Syria, many other countries in the region. So I'm worried about this type of policy. I am saying we need constructive engagement with Turkey. And this can be done if there is respect, 
of international law, if it's done on dialogue and good neighborhood policy, uh, I think then we can move forward. So I will highlight the fact that the exploratory talks now seem to be, have been decided. That's positive. I welcome that. I think that should be welcomed in the summit a day after tomorrow when it starts. And of course, I think we need to see a more comprehensive strategy for the region from the European Union, but also bottom up from our own countries and societies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, George, uh, for this comprehensive input. Um, allow me to ask you one follow up question um, quick because um, I just have to because you spoke so much uh, about kind of the EU and the Europeans as uh, yeah, an entity. And um, so within ECFR, we always look at different membership, uh, uh, member uh, state perspective, and we had um, published some notes uh, from, from the member states, and it was very obvious that there are quite different views within the EU on this subject. So how do you, kind of, from a Greek perspective, perceive the support you're getting from within the European Union? I think there is, there is, uh, there are some, well, I think this is one of the problems that in fact, we are have we have a somewhat splintered approach on this issue. So you have some member states that are very supportive of Greece and Cyprus, others that um, are less so, um, others that have, and we all have our relations and our interests with Turkey, our economic relations, the refugee issue, these are big issues, we all are, are, are very, very important. What I am looking for, and what I think we need to go back to, because we did have this. Uh, it, it did fall apart, or maybe not completely, when we did the Helsinki decision in 1999, a comprehensive strategy of a relationship between the European Union and Turkey. Yes, so the positives of this relationship, and that's what we need to bring back. What are the positives of this relationship? But what are also the obligations uh, that Turkey takes on in this positive relationship? And that, of course, includes some of the internal issues. I don't want to get into the internal issues of, of Turkey, the Copenhagen criteria. If they're not, if they don't become a member soon, still the whole issues of human rights. But I don't want to get into that because that is an important, but it's an internal issue. But the issue of good neighborly relations, so national, international law, and 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 non-use of violence or threat of violence, uh, not violating sovereign rights. These, I think, are important issues where Europe has to stand very clear on this in order to create a safe environment for real dialogue to take place and hopefully to regain the trust, which we did, we had developed in 2002, 2003. We were very close to dealing with the continental shelf issue. 2004, even I think it was 2015, 16, we were very close on the Cyprus issue. Sometimes these things have, you know, have their have their flukes because governments change, because policies may change, uh, you know, geopolitics may change. But I think this is where the European Union can provide a sense of continuity and stability, making very clear about the principles, in order to make sure that we do have this these exploratory talks, which will continue until they conclude with some important decisions on solving the, the, this issue of the continental shelf and the maritime zones. Thank you. Um, speaking about different member states, different perceptions and internal tensions, I'm very happy to have uh, uh, Dorothee Schmidt uh, on board. Uh, Dorothee, could you give us uh, your perspective uh, as, a, as a researcher, but maybe also kind of bring in the perspective of the French government a bit? Bonjour, so thank you very much for inviting me to contribute. Uh, I was very happy to listen to Joshua Pandreou's contribution because I think I was, I was more or less following the same line of reasoning when I was preparing the, the meeting. Uh, but I think it's very good to hear such, uh, I, I'd say such an optimistic, I don't mean it's idealistic, but I think it's very optimistic and I think it's what we need also. Uh, because I think it is what we've missed, we've lacked uh, very much in France over the last 
three, four months when you, you saw this escalation between France and Turkey uh, going on uh, since the incident on the uh, of uh, Libya until the escalation in the Aegean. And um, I was really appalled to see the, actually the French press, and I would say arguably most of the French officials, um, having an, an extremely dramatic um, 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 approach of the situation, vision of the situation, which I can understand, but I think was slightly overplayed. And I think this has to do also with some um, um, difficulties of perception linked to the COVID-19 crisis, etc., to internal domestic differences. So uh, I think it's very important to, to realize that we are all going through a sort of provincialization of our reflections. Like everyone is uh, uh, experiencing a sort of an intellectual lockdown and uh, arguably one of the countries that has gone through the crisis not too harmed was a power actually, it was Turkey. Uh, Greece was another country that was actually not too much hit by the COVID-19 crisis. But I think this has impaired our capacities as um, uh, EU member states to uh, really um, design a, a consistent approach diplomatically about regional issues. And what, there's, there's, there are some aspects that don't make me so optimistic, even if I think, the French should not, as I say, overplay the drama of the situation. But of course, the current crisis is different from the ones we've experienced in the past because of Turkey's excessive assertiveness, especially after the, um, they managed to completely reverse the game in Libya this summer. And because of the multiplication of conflicts that, are, that, have, that have some links or have some impact on what's going on in the Aegean and the Mediterranean, of course, Syria, Libya, and the refugee issues, which is of a, on a scale that's absolutely um, uh, new to us. So in the past, when we had to deal with the uh, Greek-Turkey difficulties, we used to buy time. We more or less counted on NATO to have some uh, confident building measures to do a, a partial de-escalation. And then we hoped for the best, like everybody would get discouraged to go further, etc. But now we have... Um, real uh, worries that, on the contrary, could escalate much further. So to me, the three important questions now are who negotiates? Who has to negotiate? You know, the Turks want to uh, do with Turk with uh, Greece on its own because uh, it's a state-to-state -state negotiation that they want. But it's also, of course, because they perceive Greece as in a position of weakness vis-a-vis -vis the big power that Turkey has become over the last decade. Um, so if we have uh, the EU back in Greece, who in the EU? Uh, I see the EU institutions rather inert, relatively disorganized. So some member states, as Mr. Papandreou said, have uh, taken sides, some of them like France, more with Greece, Cyprus. But this has endangered up to a certain point the Franco-German uh, relationship and the disagreements that have shown between uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Emmanuel Macron, I mean, not too openly, but we knew they were there, I think were extremely uh, detrimental to the image of the EU and to its capacity actually to deter uh, Turkey, if you want. So who negotiates? Fair question. What do we negotiate? Of course, because we have a complexity of issues that have been listed already. We can do with the very narrowly defined issues in the Aegean, which is probably the most easy, it doesn't seem so, but now, now that we have the rest, the bulk of the problems behind, we know that in the, in the end, maybe this conversation on strictly the definition of the sea um, borders, etc., would be the easiest one. Widely, a little more widely, we have Cyprus, and you realize that uh, the, uh, uh, the famous um, drilling ship uh, that uh, Turkey has withdrawn from Greek waters, there are some of uh, Cyprus coast now. So it means that we were completely focused on Greece, but of course Cyprus remains the big piece. Uh, but then should we bring a broader negotiation, making linkages with every uh, problem we have with the Turkish presence in the Mediterranean, of course, in uh, Libya especially, but now I see some extensions or potential extension on Caucasus since last weekend. 
And I think this this was a completely, you know, it looked like a fantasy when we talked about it uh, last uh, July when there were the f- first incidents in the Tavush between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, but it has become a reality as well. So now, uh, if you ask me who would be able to calm down the, the, the whole game, of course, Russia is the only actor that can do with Turkey in an efficient way currently, I think. And so what do we negotiate on? What sort of linkages do we do? I think we have to go for a ground negotiation, a strategic one with Turkey, but we can do it only as a very unified body. So the EU has to come together, put together a big task force and devote um, intellectual resources and human resources to this. And I'm afraid we're not, this is not a priority to us, but if we don't do that, we have no chance of seeing anything coming out good uh, from that negotiation. Take the precedent of the um, negotiation over the Syrian refugees that Angela Merkel actually did on its own with uh, Taib Erdogan and which ended up in a sort of complete deadlock for Europe and has only given Turkey leverage upon the EU. So to end uh, this uh, very pessimistic uh, reflection of mine, um, we, of course, and this also has been said by Georges Papadreou, uh, this has to do with the Turkish accession process. I was absolutely amazed to see that what the Turks now put on the table when they want to negotiate is um, the upgrading of the customs union, visas, etc. So all things that have to do with Turkish accession. And to me, it has nothing to do with what, what we're discussing. So. You have to understand that um, three days ago, uh, about 30 French parliamentarians from the right uh, side uh, asked for the um, interruption for this, for stopping completely the accession process with the EU, with the, between Turkey and the EU. And I think uh, this will gain uh, more a popularity in France. I think it's unavoidable, seeing the way that uh, Turkish issues have been dealt with, with the public in France, the Kurdish issue in the background, etc. I think we will, the, the our representatives, but not only in France, we have really, it would be very, very difficult for them to avoid, to completely shun this issue of, should we follow up with the accession process? Put it bluntly, really, or stop it altogether. Thank you. Come for the optimism, stay for the pessimism, I would say. <laughs> Thank you for, um, for your perspective. Thank you also for highlighting um, the Franco-German tensions. And I'm super happy that we have two of the most well-known kind of German uh, experts on the region in this call, um, Günther Seufert and Michael Thumann. So if you want to come in later, you are more than welcome to do that. But first, I would like to turn to, to Asle, my colleague um, at ECFR, um, and ask her what, in her opinion, the best strategy for de-escalation is, uh, if there can be some sort of new great bargain with Turkey where everybody is um, happy. And also, if you want to comment on some of the things that you have heard already also, um, and, and to put them into, into your perspective. Thanks, Jana. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for uh, a very inspiring talk, uh, Mr. Papandreou, because um, uh, we sometimes forget where we were a decade ago in terms of Turkish-Greek relations, but also in terms of Turkish-EU framework. What has changed? At the end of the day, um, the main arguments Turkey and Greece has put forth on Aegean or Eastern Mediterranean has not changed an inch since the day I started journalism, which was late mid nineties. And, uh, and it goes back decades also. So neither country really has a new position. What has clearly changed is the nature of Turkish, Turkey's relationship with Europe. The fact that accession process is no longer a reality um, the fact that it, 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 it is effectively blocked and Turkey and Europe have not managed to redefine their relationship. There is no real structured new relationship to replace what is a very dysfunctional uh, accession process. That's clearly not working, but what have we replaced it with? So nothing. Let's say 
point we should take. Uh, secondly, I think to an extent, uh, you know, yes, I, uh, Dorothy, there is a research in Turkey, uh, no doubt nationalism and neo-Ottomanism and all of that. And, you know, Turkey that wants its place under the sun, so to speak, but uh, we're also paying you know, I could go on and on about this. I've written a piece talking about Turkish Zonderweg, but uh, Turkey has always been a nationalist power and has always sort of argued the same policies in East Med. What, what is different now is we are to an extent paying a price for the marginal, marginalization of Turkey. And uh, that's come very slowly in small steps. And in this climate, uh, between 2016 and now, it's difficult to say who did what and who, it's, it's very much a chicken and egg thing. But from, it's clear for, when you watch the world from Turkey, which is where I am now, from Istanbul, it's clear that people in Ankara started feeling that they were being frozen out of East Med. And uh, several things contributed, the sense of threat that they won't be, it sounds, you know, in the international European public opinion, Turkey looks like the aggressor and, and, and uses a very combative rhetoric. But here, I think in 2018, 2019, the language was, unless Turkey takes an assertive position, they won't be able to sail a single ship across Mediterranean because let's look at the events that were happening in 2018. You had a, uh, United States, Washington come up with a new doctrine for East Med and essentially they started thinking Turkey is a difficult ally, therefore we need to build alliances uh, with Turkey's neighbors and alternative alliances with Turkey's neighbors in order to, in some sense, a buffer so to speak. And so you had the East Med pipeline, East Med gas forum with uh, Egypt, uh, Israel, uh, Greece and Cyprus, et cetera, excluding Turkey. Uh, and then you also had a uh, sort of elevation of the, of the very uh, sort of decades long military balance, so to speak, elevating the uh, strategic relationship with, uh, with uh, Greece, lifting the embargo on Cyprus, all of these st steps, I think, created a situation in which um, Turks felt marginalized, not just isolated, but marginalized. And, and they responded the way they do when, they, when there is this feeling. I'm not uh, defending the foreign policy here, but I think if you're a Turkey watcher taking a historic view, it does look very obvious that their, the response to marginalization has always been doubling down. With deployment in Libya uh, was always about East, East Med. Uh, assertive posturing was always about ISMED. Uh, and then uh, not just that, but I think what is important now is that there seems to be a widespread consensus across the political spectrum in this country, in a, in a, in a hyper-nationalist atmosphere, that Turkey does need to take an assertive uh, position on ISMED because it's facing some type of a fait accompli. So uh, this is the lay of land. I am not doing the blame Trump administration, but I do think the steps they have taken in 2018 has led to a sense of marginalization in Ankara and, uh, and, if, and they have responded to that threat. What can be done now uh, moving forward? I do think that we do need a constructive uh, engagement with Turkey. Europe needs a constructive engagement with Turkey, an interim agreement that you have mentioned, why not? But a structured new relationship. Uh, direct Turkish-Greek talks are essential. They are wonderful, they're good. They, I am not as optimistic as Mr. Papandreou that they can actually achieve something on continental shelf and the rest. But I think just the sheer act of talking is a good thing in itself. I'm happy if the forever talking is essentially something that can freeze the, the crisis, so to speak. So uh, similarly, uh, the, the, what's happened, the deconfliction mechanism in NATO is essential and useful. Um, obviously, Cyprus is the big elephant in the room in the sense that this whole thing started with Cyprus. And the, the conventional view, I think, in Europe is that, well, it's 
too big of an issue. Cyprus, let's just not open the Pandora's box. Successive round of settle, re, uh, settlement negotiations have failed. So let's skirt around the issue and have talks, Turks and Greeks talk to one another. That's a good thing, but we can't skirt around the issue because it's at the very heart of it. What are we going to do about Cyprus? It cannot be forever delayed. We either go back to uh, resettlement negotiations under the auspices of the United Nations, or you create, or you go for energy, uh, somehow resource sharing, energy sharing, in which, uh, and I understand that Greek Cypriots object to this uh, for a number of reasons, but I think that having you know, no on negotiations and no on, having no negotiations and no energy sharing is not sustainable. Uh, either uh, the UN calls for a new round of talks, or or the two sides, the two communities, sit to discuss how they can be they can share energy resources. And finally, uh, obviously, uh, combative rhetoric does not help. Uh, here or in Greece, and I think uh, officials have been very irresponsible uh, using metaphors and populist language, uh, and that is proving very counterproductive on both sides of the Aegean. And finally, I don't think sanctions would work. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. So I am somewhat more sympathetic to the German attempts to, to, to prevent uh, uh, crippling sanctions just because they would be very counterproductive. Again, going back to historic Turkish behavior, I have uh, not seen an instance in which this talks. But fine, you know, to sum it up, Cyprus, let's not forget about Cyprus. Turkish Greek talks, great. Uh, refrain from combative rhetoric and threat of hard power for sure. Uh, but also a new bargain with Turkey, a structured new relationship between Turkey and Europe, European Union is needed to replace something which is not working at the moment. Thank you very much, Asla. And um, I would like to discuss uh, the issue now with all of you, and it would be fantastic if at least some of you could turn their cameras on, because then we get the impression that kind of this is really um, an interactive debate and, and all of you can participate. So that would be just, yeah, I think a nice gesture. And, and, and I'd be glad to, if possible, to maybe make a small comment on some of the things I've heard also. Absolutely, in a minute, um, but uh, maybe, um, so I was planning to ask um, to bring kind of a German perspective in or kind of, um, and I was actually, uh, as I hinted on uh, previously, trying to, to ask Michael Thumann or Günther Seufert, uh, uh, either of you to maybe also um, comment, but maybe, Think about it, and 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 uh, I, I come back to you. And for the German perspective, and uh, Josh, uh, I give you the floor um, immediately. And um, the other participants in this call, please um, think about your questions or comments, and then use the raise hand function or write it in the chat. And uh, I'll give you the floor. But first, uh, Josh, for well, well, thank you. I think yeah. these are important points, and 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 hopefully we can be constructive in looking at how we deal with some of these points. So Dorothea was, was talking about the French-German tension. I will come back to the need for a comprehensive and collective common policy vis-a-vis -vis the region and vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Uh, and I would say that this should be a principled one. We're not talking about you know, taking sides of one against the other. I think we're saying what is best for peace and cooperation in the region within our European values. So the issues of not threatening and not using violence, respecting sovereign rights, dialogue and conflict, I mean, these basic issues need to be respected. So Europe has to be very clear on this. If Europe is clear on this, Europe should move forward in discussing and talking with Turkey on what this new relationship should be and develop a comprehensive uh, approach and bring in Turkey, but bring also the neighbors of Turkey, members of the European Union, Cyprus and Greece. We want to have good relations with Turkey. We want, we don't want to marginalize Turkey. I say that again, I was the, if you like, initial architect of this East Med cooperation. And there were some that were saying, let's create an axis against others. I said, no, 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 this has to be a comprehensive regional cooperation. We have to bring in everyone. Um, so I think, and, and Turkey 
will be marginalized if it if it's if it's if its actions marginalize it if it does if it makes acts if it create it has actions which are aggressive which are creating problems it, it is it is self marginalizing but that's not what we want that's not the purpose of this exercise the purpose is to integrate our region on principles uh, which are peaceful and cooperative and particularly in this post covid era I think another thing which is very important is that the European Union develop a regional policy. Uh, so the president of the council, uh, Michel, has talked about a conference of the region. I would add to that, make it a conference which would be the beginning of a more permanent forum and make that a forum, not only about the energy pass in this carbon world, but make it a green deal make it a future green deal for the Mediterranean. Can we see Europe and our region, but Europe taking the lead in building a Mediterranean green deal where we're moving, transitioning from the carbon economy to renewable energy? I think that will also lower the tensions. I just want to mention 10 years ago, I worked with Erdogan. I invited him, he was then prime minister, to Athens for a Mediterranean conference on renewable energy, and the environment in the Mediterranean. We had countries from almost all the Mediterranean area. We had the World Bank, EIB, and we came up with a common statement. It is possible. It's not impossible. We have been able to do this in the past. Let's see if we can do this. And uh, I see that, that, that in, this, in doing this, everybody has to participate. So Turkey has to participate, has to be part of this, but then Turkey has to accept that all member states of the European Union have to participate. And that also means Cyprus. And this is one of the contentions. Cyprus has to be in. Cyprus has to participate. It won't, we won't solve this issue of, of the maritime zones and the energy pass if Cyprus is not in. Of course, we have to solve the Cyprus problem too. But that's another, that's another element which does, shouldn't, shouldn't stop the fact that Europe could move today on building this kind of regional approach. One more point only is I think we also need to mobilize civil society. I remember in 1999 and 2000, one of the biggest contributions to the rapprochement between Greece and Turkey, but also the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot community was civil society. Women's organizations, local government, business, um, artists, basketball, football teams, um, many, many. And foreign policy today is not confined to the foreign ministers. Our public and our public opinions are crucial in helping this. It's very easy to whip up nationalism and fear and hatred. At the same way, civil society can do the opposite and create new understanding and pathways of cooperation, building and possible peace. Thank you very much. I think um, Asla and Dorothy uh, will come back to some of the points uh, you raised. But first, um, I want really to, to make this more interactive and to give participants the floor. Um, and as I, um, I see you, uh, Mr. Kunz, but uh, maybe, uh, yeah, Michael Tuman or Gunther Seifert, one of you volunteers. So both of you volunteer. So I have a speaker's list of four, and maybe we take um, these four and then, um, uh, yeah. Uh, give it back to the panel. So I have uh, Michael Thumann, uh, Günther Seufert, Eckhard Kunz, and then Sinan uh, Ulgim. And uh, yeah, Michael, just yeah, to yeah. Uh, let me go first with um, yeah a, a brief um, brief perspective on on uh, how it looks from uh, all the East Med conflict looks from Berlin and and a question uh, to the speakers. Well, as, as I see it, how the German government has reacted uh, with uh, against the backdrop of Germany having the EU presidency at the moment, um, I think uh, Berlin is confronted with a kind of triple crisis as they see it. There are tensions in the East Med. There is, um, on, there is ongoing unrest and protest in Belarus and an overdue reaction of the EU to these protests. And plus Germany and, and, and uh, Europe with Germany have a problem with uh, Russia in deteriorating relations uh, with Russia over the case of uh, 
Alexei Navalny. So the question is how to how to react and and how to manage uh, through all these three crises. And uh, in the German Parliament, if you ask uh, deputies, there is across the board there is a mood to react clearly and harshly. Uh, more with regards to Turkey, I must say, uh, than with uh, there. There is a there's a unity on that, I would say, whereas with Russia, we always have uh, the Linke and, uh, of course, the right-wing AFD uh, pursuing a pro-Russian cause. But um, if you look uh, at, and if you talk to government officials, it's quite different because uh, they see this triple crisis as something which can easily get out of hand. And um, they, they think, they simply, both Germany, but also the EU could not handle a simultaneous uh, escalation with both Russia and Turkey. And of course the open question, what to do about Belarus. And we see that all these crises are interlinked because a clear response of the EU to the Belarus crisis is, is blocked mostly by Cyprus at the moment because of problems with Turkey. So they, they all are linked to each other. So the, the approach I see is here, um, do not escalate at all fronts and keep the EU somehow united on Turkey, Belarus and Russia. And the problem of this approach is that we, we hear nothing, we, nothing comes out of it. So we have unity at the expense of silence, uh, which I think can't be the last word of the EU, but uh, I think that's where we stand before the summit. So um, let me ask uh, a brief question um, because very important in, uh, in the crisis, uh, I think in the East Med has been the domestic background uh, and uh, the, the domestic background for postering in the region. And I, I'd like uh, to ask Mr. Papandreou and um, Mrs. Aydenshashpas, uh, both of them, how they look at um, at, at Mr. Erdogan's and Mr. Mitsutaki's performance and how important it is for them to show a strong hand. Um, for Erdogan, of course, he has to balance somehow um, the mood in Turkey. He has to cope with the bad economic situation. And on the other hand, for Mitsutaki, who himself is obviously not a nationalist, but of course, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how much he is affected by nationalist sentiments. In his, in his country and how much he has to respond to that. So uh, what is, where is the ground for, for politics as, as uh, Mr. Papandre has just described, uh, uh, taking a step towards Turkey, uh, taking, a, uh, is, is, there any, is there any space for that? Or is the discussion at the moment so heated domestically um, that the uh, hands of both leaders are quite tied? Thank you, Michael. And because I know you, I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself. So Michael Tumann is a, a very well-known journalist in Germany working for Die Zeit and uh, working on, on the region for many years. Um, thank you for your input. Um, now we have another, uh, not a journalist, but a super specialist on the region uh, from Germany, from a colleague from um, SWP, Günther Seufert. Um, and uh, Günther, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I, I would underline what, what Michael has said uh, at the very end of his uh, intervention. Uh, I'm not yeah, really to ask uh, Mr. Papandreou if there is uh, um, room for, for compromise and for negotiations of uh, the maritime borders in, in Greece. But I think what is even more important, I think Asle has uh, naturally talked about the difficulty of Turkey feeling itself ma ma marginalized or being actually marginalized. But I think we cannot discuss this state of affairs without referring uh, to Turkey's uh, domestic policy. And uh, naturally, uh, we, we see that uh, also the concept of the blue homeland has been in the shelves for years. And uh, we have to ask why this happened now. We had, as Asla said, it's an old conflict. Uh, we had the... Uh, the idea and the concept of the of the blue of the blue homeland in the shelves and why had it exploited now why, why had it be applied applied now and in which in which uh, domestic atmosphere and, and for which reasons 
I think this is important because Turkey is not only marginalized uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's also marginalized in the Arab world and it's marginalized due to a lot of uh, different policies uh, in Europe and, and in NATO. And I think we cannot in a way uh, discuss the problem as it's, it's a natural outcome of, of, of a changing uh, US policy uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, the feeling in, in Germany in regard to, to France, I think we clearly see that there was a lot of anger in, in Germany that uh, the government was not even informed about uh, French actions in the Eastern Mediterranean. But I would also say that I have the impression that uh, you will find a lot of persons uh, in the administrations that would despite the fact that there was anger, anger, that they acknowledge that it was maybe really this mix, even if not coordinated, uh, between uh, the readiness of Germany to, to negotiate and uh, to, uh, to really to, to, to say openly also that Turkey has a, has a point, uh, naturally, uh, in, in, in substance of the, of the quarrel, uh, but also of uh, the French uh, action and naturally also of the uh, building up of an anti-Turkish front. I think if this would not have been the case, maybe uh, Mr. Erdogan would have uh, escalated uh, the, uh, the situation even more. And today we see that with, we have much more mild and more, much moderated uh, statements uh, from Turkey, both from the president and, and from his speaker. And I think this is naturally, in, at least in my, in my view, it's a result of the uh, mixed, uh, uncoordinated, but again, action of, 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 European, of European powers. Uh, when it comes to um, the difficulties, how to create a new framework for Turkey or for our policies with Turkey. I think this is really, really extremely difficult because uh, I think we are now, we, we, we are running as Europeans, we are running three uh, different processes with Turkey at one and the same time. And we have still the membership process that is actually now blocked, but it is still, uh, inform it's, it is still informing the discussion and it is in a way affecting uh, the public, the public opinion, and the uh, immediate response in, in France or, or in Austria that we should stop stop uh, the the next the, the membership process is uh, a sign for this, and we have at the same time I think since 2016 we have a process of cooperation with Turkey in the migration in the migration uh, issue, but also in the anti-terror. Uh, cooperation. And now very recently with the crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean, we have naturally also uh, a process of, of containing Turkey because Turkey is threatening uh, interests uh, of European member states. And it is in a way, yes, of, of European member states and it is in a way triggering processes of, of solidarity in the European Union. And therefore the question is how to deal with, three, with these three different uh, processes and particularly how to deal with the membership process at the one hand side that has a clear normative framework and where it was easy for Europe to unite in a policy towards Turkey in this framework because it was Turkey who had to do reforms and now but this on the one hand on the other hand side now we have a policy when it comes to cooperation and containment you need a more flexible policy you need a policy that is taking regard to or take into account the interest, the security interest, but also the economic interest of European member states. And this makes it much more difficult to work out uh, a common approach, but it has to be an approach that is both taking Turkey's concerns into account, but that it also demanding uh, uh, towards Turkey and has also to show, I think some, some something like, like red lines. Uh, when Thank you. Thank <laughs> And I, I think, think yeah. <laughs> I think we have to separate. Now here would I, here I would re really uh, go together with uh, George Papandreou. We have to separate these two processes uh, because uh, now we see, for example, in the customs union, it is uh, the logic of the membership process that hinders us to really to go into negotiations on the customs union that could be an offer to Turkey and that could also could in a way, yeah, complement 
uh, a strategy with clear demands and red lines towards it. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, no. I just want to, to give that also to the panel later, uh, the question or the kind of prediction um, you, you raised um, there. So um, I want to take uh, two more um, interventions and then I give it back to the panel. Um, and the next on my list is Eckhart Kunz. Could you please introduce yourself uh, shortly for the other participants? And you have to unmute yourself. You're still muted. We cannot hear you. This is on? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. My name is Eckhard Kunz. I used to work for the Council of the European Union in the 1990s. That's where I met George Papandreou when he was responsible for European affairs. And he told me, you will be surprised. Greece will not block any membership negotiations with Turkey. It might be Germany or somebody else. Well, in the end, they started, but they there we are. I was also head of the European Department in the Foreign Office and between 2006 and 2011, German ambassador to Turkey. Now, uh, EU and uh, Turkey and all the local conflicts, especially the bilateral uh, problems between Greece and Turkey, I think Turkey will never accept that the EU would side Greece on bilateral aspects because they say the EU is party. You have members like Greece and you have Cyprus and um, Michel Thunmann already made the point, uh, Cyprus blocks uh, even a common stand on Belarus. No, it doesn't work. But what could work in a way, if to take up a deal by uh, George Favondrio is maybe if you want to develop a strategy, do it together with the Turks. And whether we like it or not, and whether, uh, as Günther Seufert says, Turkey has been marginalized somewhere, but they are an important player. And uh, George Schmidt made the point also on the Caucasus. We have now this crisis on Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now there are news, I don't know if it's true, that Turkey is sending troops. What is happening there? Uh, what is happening in Syria? Can we solve the refugee crisis without uh, Turkey? Uh, Libya was mentioned, and so on and so forth. So we are busy, of course, with Russia and with Belarus, but the European Union has to take into account that all these regional questions cannot be solved without Turkey. And that's why we have to think about a mechanism, how to include Turkey in it. Now the EU as such, it's very difficult even to come to a common stand, but there are single players and also maybe somebody likes it or not, but we have had an Istanbul composition to deal with Syria with more or less success. We have had a Normandy format and others. So how can we approach all these questions together with Turkey, EU and Turkey? Thank you. That is I think, for Asla uh, in the end. Um, but thank, thanks to all of you for broadening also the spectrum, including Russia, bringing the other conflicts in. I still think uh, that we cannot talk about everything and need to yeah, to, to also focus on, on, on the issue at hand and, and, and maybe um, uh, talk more about uh, possible kind of ways out of this crisis. But you're right that uh, we cannot really limit it or that we have to take additional um, aspects into account. Maybe, Asli, you could later also comment on, on the Russia question, because this is something that is very much, uh, I think, on all our heads, Turkish-Russia relations. and. How this is going to play out and, and maybe if you want to briefly also comment on, on, on um, the role uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the recent conflict, uh, in the long in the frozen conflict, or now not so frozen conflict any longer uh, between um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. But uh, first I want to give the floor to Sinan Ulgen and um, then back to the panel. Oh, and yeah, in the chat are questions as well. Okay, <laughs> thanks Felix. Thank you, Jana. Um, I'm the uh, chairperson of EDAM, a think tank established in Istanbul, and I have also have an affiliation with the Carnegie Endowment. I have two questions, one for Mr. Papandreou. Um, I've uh, listened to you uh, very carefully, and can, could, could we surmise uh, from your statements that you would actually uh, be in favor of inviting Turkey in the ESMAD gas consortium without conditions? Uh, that would be my question to you. 
And my second question to Dorote, who I salute, it's been a while, and, uh, but also, even though he's not on the panel, perhaps Michael uh, who can give us a German perspective or Ambassador Kunz, is um, I think there's a real difficult dilemma in the sense that uh, it's understandable, and I fully agree with Asla, that sanctions is not the way forward with Turkey. But how do you build a positive agenda, whether it, for, it involves the customs union or visa liberalization or a track, of, you know, any positive track where you, with a country where the erosion of, you know, democratic standards has been very visible in the last few years. So that's the EU's dilemma, it seems to me. And how do you overcome that? Do you sort of uh, lower your standards because it was Germany which, you know, back in 2016 uh, did obstruct the start of the negotiations on the customs union. Uh, so is there a reflection in Germany that they, you know, the, the government would be ready uh, to either lift its, uh, its, its barriers to the start of these negotiations? Or what is the thinking given that the situation has not necessarily improved in Turkey from 2016 till now? Thank you. Uh, maybe we can um, answer that from a German perspective um, later. But now uh, I think I want to give it back to the panel to give you an opportunity to react to the many things that you have heard. Uh, Cyprus was mentioned and there is also just to add that uh, to your plate. Um, there was also a question in the chat. Um, whether it was possible to solve this particular issue without solving the permanent issue of, of Cyprus first. And um, yeah, I think this is a very substantial question, um, but maybe you have some thoughts on this. Asla uh, already mentioned it um, in her introductory remarks. Um, so um, maybe we start uh, with you, Asla, and then um, work backwards and Please address some of the questions. Sure. Uh, there were uh, several references to domestic policy. And the question is, is it, uh, is it, a, sort of, is it something that's impacting uh, Turkish behavior in Eastern Mediterranean? Well, uh, no doubt there is a new Turkey. No doubt there's a resurgent Turkey with growing self-confidence, uh, you know, the, developing its capabilities and all of, and all of that. And it is a fact that uh, Erdogan is in an alliance with uh, a nationalist party. But I recall, but, but I remember very, I, as far as I remember, with the exception of a 10 year period during the EU accession process, perhaps, Turkey has always been a nationalist country. Uh, before Erdogan and after Erdogan, now yes, President Erdogan has almost reinvented himself as the ultimate nationalist, but it is also the case that his predecessors and perhaps his successors will also advocate uh, very similar positions in Eastern Mediterranean. The same Erdogan uh, is exact, is, has been the interlocutor with Germany, with Angela Merkel, and agreed to start negotiations, to return to uh, the um, uh, exploratory talks, has agreed to pull back Turkey's exploration ship uh, twice over the past few months. So I don't think uh, nationalism in Turkey uh, is something that is, uh, there's something very pragmatic about Erdogan and his uh, leadership style. Uh, he's open to transactionalism. And uh, I think that he uh, seems to have found a person that he considers an honest broker in Angela Merkel. And I think that's an important uh, asset for European Union because it's often the case that uh, there's sort of uh, the, you know, the problem with uh, identifying exactly the right interlocutors in crises that involve Turkey. So, um, yes, uh, there's nationalism, but it, I think it's the, there's also pragmatism here. Uh, I say that clearly. It, it is Turkey. Turkey is interested in uh, in uh, getting in continuing to explore in Eastern Mediterranean, in the territory that it considers its own continental shelf. That is a given. 
But you know, a way out of this, of this deadlock, deadlock could be a movement in Cyprus. Uh, people consider Cyprus to be a bigger headache than all of these issues we involved, but any discussion, any technical committee, any kind of movement for talks, exp you know, any sort of the, the, this decision to establish an escrow account for both sides of the community, a, a sovereign wealth fund, a, 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 you know, a, a, all of these things would have a huge positive impact on tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean. Blue homeland is uh, a metaphor. It's, uh, I worry that it's being uh, used, it's seeping into the, it has seeped into the political discourse in Turkey too much. Uh, as far as I know, and as far as I'm told, it's not Turkey's official doctrine. So the blue homeland maps that you see are not the maps Turkish officials go around submitting to the UN or, 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 or when they sit to negotiate with, with their Greek counterpart. But it is one of these issues that is increasingly instrumentalized uh, in the public opinion and in the public space. And of course, there's always uh, there's always a concern when a populist slogan becomes it, it is too 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 well integrated into the public discourse. I uh, think that uh, another thing we haven't uh, talked about in a way out in terms of Aegean and uh, um, and in Eastern Mediterranean is essentially we have to this has to be framed as a win-win economically and politically. I mean, I think right now Turkey uh, suffers from a sense of lone wolfism uh, that it's left out that everybody is against Turkey. And this is sometimes being used by politicians. Uh, they're all against us. They're all lining up. And well, you know, I mean, there is at some point there needs to be a constructive engagement that does also say uh, that there is a win for Turkey uh, the, the, for uh, pursuing a brighter path with its neighbors and with the European Union. That, there has been no uh, promise of a, a brighter future. And that of course makes everything so much worse. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia, the flare up is, uh, has come uh, at a surprising speed, although there was a previous uh, instance in July, of course, now this is far more serious, but not only that, you have Turkish involvement far more openly and far more uh, sort of, uh, in some sense, a, a more heavy buildup and presence of Turkish support for the Azerbaijan army. Uh, what, you, what we haven't figured out in this conflict is where Russia is. It's hard for me to imagine a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan without a green light from Russia. Uh, it, it is not a situation, I mean, I, I've seen several accounts recently, uh, analysis of underlining coming from US or, or Western uh, analysts uh, uh, underlining that this is yet another conflict in which Turkey and Russia are on the opposite sides. I'm not so sure, to be very honest with you. I'm not so sure that Russia does not want this. I'm not, it, they've been uh, having a, an up and down relationship with Armenia and Pashinyan and you know, they could uh, allow for a, an escalation for a couple of days, a few weeks, whatever, and then emerge as the ultimate mediator. But uh, yes, Turkish role has been more apparent than Turkey has always supported Azerbaijan in this conflict for reasons that we all know. But this time it's military footprint has been far more open and obvious. And of course that coming right before a very important EU summit that is uh, not necessarily going to go down that well in the European public opinion. Thank you, Astra, for the comprehensive answer. Um, I would, um, before I go to Dorothee, uh, because we are running out of time uh, quickly, like to bring uh, Marie uh, Vane smith in because She's working on with the EU emission in uh, Cyprus, so she might have uh, something to say also on the question that was raised. And she has a quick question on EU engagement. And before the two uh, European um, panelists speak, maybe you can uh, include her questions uh, to your answer. 
Hello and thank you and of course just to first um, say that I'm of course speaking in my personal capacity not in, on behalf of the United Nations but indeed I work uh, for the United Nations team uh, based in Cyprus that is um, facilitating the um, negotiations between the Turkish um, Cypriot and Greek Cypriot communities. Um, my question about um, Ashley uh, raised in her opening remarks um, the marginalization that has been felt by Turkey over the over the years, um, I would um, I would say that I think this has been then compounded by the fact that there's also been this lack of engagement by international community to this region. Say that there's not been Cyprus negotiations since 2017. Overall, I think uh, things have been left develop uh, to develop to the point that that they did now. And I would say that what happened uh, recently with the German facilitation, that was supported widely by, by the EU or from within the EU, but also I understand that through NATO uh, members and, and the organization. I just wanted to ask, um, do you think that um, this has been understood now? Um, by the say by key members in the in the EU that this is an area where attention is is needed also also in the future and I also just want to say it's it's good to, to hear also Cyprus issue being being raised as as part of uh, the equation because this is very much how how we as an office also see that Cyprus question is very much a link to to all these other other issues that have developed in in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, Dorothy, you can also comment a bit how the Cyprus issue is currently seen uh, in, in France uh, and then also comment on the other things that you've heard and ask, uh, answer the questions. I think Cyprus is not seen in France uh, currently. I think it's hidden behind Greece. But I would disagree that there's no attention from the international community on Cyprus. I think there's a lot of intermittent attention, if you want, but... Uh, uh, the international community is focused on the East Med at large, and so, of course, there's Syria, uh, now there's Lebanon, uh, the rest of the Med, of course, Libya, where the international community is also committed. So um, it's just that Cyprus is one piece, uh, and it used to be, I would say, a small piece between Cyprus and Turkey, and it has now become, again, a bargaining chip in a sort of uh, very hazy, uh, broad uh, negotiation relationship, etc. So I'd like to go back to um, uh, Sinan and uh, Aslo's questions and comments, because I think it's very interesting. Like when I listen to Aslo exposing her ideas, I, I fully agree on like 80% uh, of it. And then there's 20% the where I think, but what's, what's she saying? What does she have in mind? Come on, like saying, Angela Merkel is clearly an honest broker. That is not. I mean, for the French, it's not, I tell you. And I'm quite sure for the rest of Europe, it's not either. Uh, see what Merkel's done with the refugee issue. Come on. She's been completely, you know, uh, she's, she's been committing us to something that we cannot, where we cannot do anything, where Turkey doesn't want to deliver every other day, etc. And we're being hostage. So that's the perception in France. Uh, and so I don't see why the Turks would see that France is not an honest broker uh, with Greece, but uh, Merkel would be. What's, what's the difference? Come on. Uh, so that's, that's um, now boiling down to the, the idea of the, how we have to change. I fully agree with Asla that we have to completely reset the EU-Turkey relationship and it has nothing to do with the accession. And I think I quite strongly agree we have to get rid of the accession process because it's binding us on both sides. Like we're making false connections on every side. But the problem is that we don't have something that's at the same level to replace the accession process, which was probably engaged at a moment of ground optimism, which was a unique time in history, you know, but now we would need something of the same scale to offer. So we have to devote time, people, as I said, human intellectual resources and financial resources to it probably, but we have to place this relationship on a, on a strategic scale. And there we have the dilemma Sinan hinted at, that how do we deal with values? Because George Papanoglu has been insisting that we have to have a value-based, a principal relationship with Turkey. And I'm not sure if we pass on to the strategic level, like the US, that the Americans have had for decades, we can still discuss principles and values with Turkey. So 
But you have to realize when we started the accession process, it was all about technicalities. It had nothing to do with values. This came after Gezi, arguably, after 2013, when the Germans decided that they had to go back to the Copenhagen criteria and say that the Turks were completely astray, you know, from any uh, uh, democratic uh, respect of minorities, etc. The list of things that we have in the political, in the Copenhagen political criteria, but nobody had ever raised, risen the political criteria before. Gezi, to, to, to my knowledge, with Turkey. And then just another point on uh, France and Germany. Okay, I see everywhere now also in France, we're very happy with that. Like, you know, we've reached what we wanted. We've had this di perfect division of labor, good cop, bad cop. Believe me, it was not how we perceived before, before we managed to have this result. And I think we lose a lot with not coordinating because we all know that the... Uh, economic leverage is on Germany and the diplomatic political pressure comes from and if we agree in advance on what to do they also have someone to talk to they will know what we want and I think it's it would be good for the negotiation we have to engage in a grand negotiation with Turkey because they will have to make their mind clear about their perspectives and what they want because I'm not sure it's so super consistent but this I can say about Europe as well. If you have the French, you know, drawing from that side, pushing on the other, etc., it doesn't work for the Turks either. So I think, and that's that was one of my points. We argued with that with the, my colleague from the DGAP also, like two years ago. We have to have a format, a Franco-German format, to talk with Turkey. This is not alternative to the EU, but we need one that's institutionalized. And we do not necessarily need to have to put in, in but we need a Franco-German thing because it's the only format that the Turks respect within the EU. Thank you very much. Also, um, I very much appreciated your comments on the honest broker. We love, we Germans love to see ourselves as the uh, honest broker. And it was, I think sometimes it's healthy to, to be reminded by outsiders that this is not always the case uh, for everybody. Um, Asla, I would like to give it first to to draw. It's a two finger. So yeah, then you have thirty seconds, and I'm counting. Can you just, uh, for the record, uh, repeat my sentence, which was that uh, it's clear that Angela Merkel is seen as an honest broker in Ankara by President Erdogan, and that's a big asset for. But tell them she's not. Tell them it's not going to happen. Well, but 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 it, let me. <laughs> She is seen as such by Erdogan is a big asset for the European Union. The fact is that there have for the longest time been no channels for the past couple of years. Right now you have Merkel and Erdogan talking to one another twice a week, once a week at least, twice a week. And that is an asset in term at a time when we had, you know, a very dysfunctional relationship. This was not a comment about, uh, you know, whether or not she is an honest broker and my own uh, position on these issues. But I think that let's just uh, not forget that it's an asset that Erdogan sees her as someone he can talk to. Yes, but Merkel's going. Don't forget that. <laughs> Nevertheless, I mean, she's not gone yet. Uh, there is still uh, another year, more or less, and maybe uh, we can achieve something in, in the meantime. But now uh, over to George, uh, please. You are kind of- thank, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, on the first question, I think uh, Gunter mentioned, uh, is there space for cooperation? If we continue this rhetoric, of course, we're closing the space because all the, understandable taboos, but actual wounds of the past come back open again, and and we create a tension, uh, and, and it makes it very difficult politically for anyone to move. Uh, on the other hand, I have seen that we have had great space for cooperation. We have, in the past, been able to sit down, get away from the rhetoric, get away from the big words, and really look at the actual issue at hand, which is to delimit our continental shelf and at this point also the economic maritime zones. Uh, and there are complications and difficulties and technicalities, but we can have serious and I would say in good faith discussions, and we have had good faith discussions. It's taken a long time. Russia and Norway took 40 years 
to, to accomplish this. We've been doing this now for 14, 15 years. We've done 60 rounds, but we stopped. And I think the reason we stopped was it actually was internal to Turkey. The generals, some generals came over during the coup. They were not returned. This also had an effect on the exploratory talks. Let's begin them again. Um, secondly, EU and should it be part of the negotiations? Um, I would say yes, Merkel did help in pushing for the exploratory talks, but I don't expect and I don't want, I would say, the European Union to be directly involved in the details of the negotiation between Greece and Turkey. It may sound peculiar, but I have, from my experience, what I would like to see is a comprehensive, and I know, I think it was um, Michael that mentioned how the complexities the complexities, the refugee issue, uh, Middle East, Syria, Iraq, the Kurdish issue, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia. I mean, this, this is a comp Libya. It's a, there are complexities in the region. But that is exactly the reason why Europe needs to have a comprehensive strategy for the region to give clarity on where we want to go. So what we would expect as Greeks is clear principles, if we like red lines, that should not be violated, not just for Turkey, but for any of our neighbors, of how we deal with possible disputes. This is important. And if that exists, we can sit down with the Turks I, and be very open and honest and see if we can, you know, I've, I felt the best time is when the two of us would sit down on a table, be very honest with each other, we could agree on things or disagree on other things, but build up a trust that we're trying to solve these issues. Now, I do hope that Mitsotakis and Erdogan develop a relationship, not only political, but also personal, and at the lower levels also, because we had done this throughout the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but even through other ministries working together. We had a task force, a Greek task force, which was training EU, uh, Turkish diplomats on EU law. That's what I, I will come to what Mr. Eckhart said, yes, we want to be one of the engines in seeing a new relationship between the EU and Turkey. Now, what will that relationship be? I cannot describe it in details now, but there are certain principles. I would say, let us not stop the accession process. Let us see if we can find another parallel process and maybe we call it an interim process. What will happen with accession Let's leave that to rest for, for the moment. Let's not make a decision right now, but let's create an interim process with an interim relationship, which we look at these issues like the customs union, the visa issue, the refugee issue, and of course, the issues of East Med uh, in the area. Um, marginalization of Turkey. Let me put it this way. We are the last country, and I would say Cyprus is the last country and Greece that wants to marginalize Turkey. What we want is good relations with Turkey. They are our neighbors. They will always be our neighbors. You will always be our neighbors, actually. We don't want and see none. We don't want marginalized Turkey. We want a good cooperation. And when we have cooperated, we've had amazing results. I remember we had no tourists, basically, between our two countries. Only a few years ago, we had over a million Turks coming to, to, to Greece and, and vice versa. We have huge economic relations. We have the potential to work politically in the region if we have that will to solve or help solve some of the more difficult problems in, in, in the area. So I, I do not see us as wanting marginalization, but of course our reaction to aggressive statements will be of course, you know, call for sanctions or, or you know, we need some punishment and so on. We don't want to punish Turkey. We want to create a framework where we can work and cooperate together. Um, so, and when we did this, when we were able to do this some years ago, we had a very strong support in both Turkey and in Greece of this process. I remember when I started the process in 99, I had the opposition calling me a traitor. In a few years, we had 70% approval rating for our policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, 70% approval rating. So there is a huge space to do this, but the rhetoric must stop, the threats must stop. Uh, we should 
European Union should put down the, the principles, create the space so that we can actually have a much better so solution. On the resources, the sources of, 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 of um, which Sinan asked me, of course we want Turkey involved. I'm, I won't get involved with the, with, with, with the details. This also means that there has to be some rapprochement between Cyprus and Turkey, the Republic of Cyprus and Turkey. Turkey cannot say, I don't want Cyprus in, but how are you gonna solve this issue? Okay, let's solve the Cyprus issue, but that may take a longer period of time. Sit down with Cyprus and let's, let's I think what Michel has proposed, the president of the council, to have a, a conference where all the, the, the area, the participants of the area can sit down and talk about these issues and maybe create a forum. And as I said, let's make it a green deal forum. So it's not just carbon, but it's the future because let me put it this way, realistically, carbon prices, have, I mean, petrol, petrol prices have gone down, gas prices have gone down, partly because of the pandemic, partly because investors and countries are no longer investing or investing much less in, in carbon energy. So we need to move to a transition green deal. This is also an opportunity. We can use this as an opportunity to lower tensions. Fighting about something that in the future may not be needed or may not be profitable is also somewhat, I would say, unrealistic, not to be harsher on that. So I am, what I'm saying is the European Union can play a role, not Germany alone, not France alone. Thank you, France, for all your support. Yes, but that's not going to bring solutions. We need a common European policy. I would even say the Franco-German cooperation, yes, it's very good. It's a pillar of Europe, but bring in everybody else. And particularly, I think Greece at this point needs to be one of the architects of the new relationship between Turkey and the European Union. That's how it worked in the past. That could be uh, the future. But we have to lower tensions and be uh, and, and, and respect each other. And if we do so, uh, there may be a prospect for the region. It's important. And it's more important today because of all these geopolitical changes, because of what's happening, whether it's Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Libya, Syria, and so on, the Middle East. It's more important than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Thank, Thank you, you George. Much. Yeah, I'm afraid we need to uh, end this now, although I, it feels like we have just started the conversation. There are so many issues that are not solved and so many things where I think you, you would need to go back uh, to each other. But uh, we are running out of time, um, and I thank you very much for um, yeah, taking the time to be with us, for your patience, for especially uh, to the panel for your remarks, but also to, um, to the audience, to the ones that have made comments or asked questions and um, who helped to make this uh, a vivid experience for all of us. Um, Birgit Wetzel has put also um, a commentary uh, down with a recommendation for a Bertelsmann study, which I don't know, so you might want to look into that uh, as well. And I think um, as ECFR, we just take this as yeah, a hint that we need to deepen the debate on this topic and just invite all of you again. Uh, and uh, yeah, discuss this further because, as I said, I, I think we are only at the beginning uh, of of the exchange. Um, in the meantime, I hope um, that you stay safe and well, and that you will join us again uh, at one of our events, and uh, that you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Anna. Thank you. Keep well. Thank you. <laughs> bye Thank bye. You. Keep well. Thank you.